I'm Louise Harrison, sister of the late Beatle George Harrison, and now author of a book called My Kid Brothers Band, also known as the Beatles. And you're listening to me speaking with Rabbi Saul Solomon, Dave's gone by on UNC Radio. Cheerio. Shalom, shalom, hello, hello. I know why I say hello. I say hello because I'm going to be talking to Louise Harrison. She is an author, she's also an advocate, and she's written a book called My Kid Brother's Band, a.k.a. The Beatles, because her kid brother was George Harrison, one of the legends of popular music. She grew up with him. She actually brought him to America first before uh, they did the whole Shea Stadium thing. And she knew him through all of his life. And she's had a big life even beyond those years. So won't you please welcome to the neighborhood, Louise Harrison. Shalom, Louise. And shalom to you too, Rabbi. It's wonderful to be speaking on your radio show. Thank you very much. Now, I, I know that you have this beautiful English accent, but you've been living in America for like five decades or so. What, how, how do you still have that accent? I guess because that's the way I was brought up. Well, but you figure you'd lose it because you should have a flat Midwestern, like, I, are you in Iowa or did you move already or where are you now? No, right now I'm in California. Oh, so why did you leave the Midwest after all those years? For the weather? Uh, no, I, I'm, I probably will be going back. Right now I'm working on a project with a number of people here in California. Uh, they're wanting to uh, do some kind of a small uh, little uh, documentary about that year of my life in 1963, when unbeknownst to everybody in the world now, uh, I was uh, running around all the radio stations and researching the American music market in order to... Uh, uh, advise Brian, Brian Epstein, the, uh, you know, their manager, uh, about how to break into the um, American music market and get the Beatles accepted and known over here. Uh, so th that was what I was doing during 1963. I had moved into this country in, in uh, what, March of 63, along with my engineer husband. And uh, being a bit of a ham myself, uh, when my mum started sending me all the little Beatles singles that were coming out, I decided, okay, I've got to see what I can do to get them accepted over here. And so that was when I started my uh, promotional uh, uh, project. And so, uh, but it's a, a part of Beatle history that nobody's ever heard of. And I happen now to be working with a, a wonderful group of uh, young fellows who have, we have a band called Liverpool Legends. And uh, I've been working with them now for about 10 years. And they had said to me, you know, that's some part of Beatle history that nobody's ever heard of. And uh, before you leave the planet, you know, I'm going to be 84 in uh, in August, they say, before you leave the planet, maybe you ought to let people know what you did. And so uh, that was why I finally wrote my book. Yes. And also, yes. yeah, one of the main reasons for writing the book also was to let people know how George became uh, the kind of person that everybody loves and admires. And that was largely due to the um, influence and upbringing of our parents. Well, that's, that's, you know, because you're an expert, as it were, on those first, let's say, 20 years of his life. Which, I mean, everybody kind of knows what happened in the, the late 1960s and 70s up through, you know, the years after that. But you were there, and not that many people were that close to him from when he was a little tiny, tiny tot. Was he was a little bitty baby? That's right. Well, I met him first when he was eight hours old, the morning after he was born. Uh, all of us kids were born at home you know, with a, a midwife, uh, but I met him at, uh, first thing in the morning before I left to go to school, and, uh, you know, so I got to hold him in my arms when he was just born. He was uh, ten and a half pounds when he was born, so he already looked wow. like a three-month-old baby. Good Lord. And he had this beautiful big brown eyes, and his eyelashes were fully grown, and his fingernails were fully grown, and he looked just absolutely gorgeous. I was really thrilled. So you were, was there any jealousy? I mean, you had some other brothers, but were you a little girl that you're, you wouldn't get attention anymore because, oh, now you had another one? 
No, no, we never had any of that kind of, you know, interaction. My parents were just really, really wonderful people, and there was no such thing as favoritism in the family. We were all treated with equal amount of love and uh, caring, and we all treated each other the same way. And it was a matter of whatever one person in the family maybe got a little praise about, everybody else was thrilled for them. So, you know, there was none of that, uh, you know, uh, spitefulness or anything like that that you often see in families. We were very fortunate to have the kind of parents that I've often said, if everybody had parents like ours, there wouldn't be any wars because people would be so kind toward each other. That would be <laughs> uh, from your mouth to God's ears, you know, literally. Un unlikely to ever happen, but still. Uh, but let me ask also, then, um, were you s middle class, comfortable, Growing up, it was money tight? I mean, it was the war also. Yeah, well, I suppose money was tight, but we never ever realized it. My father was a bus driver in Liverpool. He drove those big corporation, you know, double-decker buses in Liverpool. So he always had a steady job. And uh, we lived in, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, you know, mm -hmm. a working class uh, environment. But, uh, you know, we never ever really realized that uh, we were such anything considered to be poor because we always had whatever we needed. And, you know, even during the war where things were rationed, uh, we had as much as everybody else had. So, uh, you know, we, we never ever felt deprived or anything like that. And, you know, my parents were such that uh, we were constantly t were taken to, uh, you know, to the beach across the, the other side of the River Mersey and taken to the parks to go and play, and you know, play kind of the English version of baseball. And uh, we would go to the parks also with our uncles, and they would, uh, you know, rent a little rowboat and take us rowing on the lake. So we had a very, very, uh, you know, interesting and, uh, uh, you know, lively childhood. So uh, I never ever felt deprived in any way. I, I never realized there was an English version of baseball. Didn't they, what do they call it? It's called rounders. Oh, well, so and you know, and it's not the other thing. It's most, yeah, it's mostly a girls' game in England. Oh, and it's not cricket. I mean, that's a totally different thing. But oh, wow, go figure. Well, <laughs> let me ask also. Do you remember um, war? To, was, were you ever scared? Were there bombings near you? Did uh, your oh, heck no, no. That that was one of the things that I find so weird now in the United States is, you know, they had this nine eleven thing and. There was about enough people killed that day to cover one city in one week in England during the war, you know. And yet everybody's now all paranoid and going, ter you know, being terrorized and everything all the time. And you got to take your shoes off at the airport and get groped by the TSA <laughs> people. But in England, no, we weren't scared at all. In fact, we kids used to run out into the backyard when the, the German bombers were flying above, and we'd shake our fists at them and say, you know, you just watch out, we get a hold of you, we'll tear you limb from limb. So we were never scared at all. Well, that, that's like the opening scene of that, what was it, a Tom Stoppard uh, scripted movie? I think Spielberg might have directed it. Um, I forget what it was, but that's a, a, an image of uh, this English film that came out, of the child running and, and shaking his fist at uh, a German airplane from the R, you know, and, and cheering from the RAF. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember what, what the I, I've never I've never heard that movie. I'll have to look out for it. <laughs> yeah, so memories now of you and your brother growing up in toddlerhood, you know, pre-teens and, and just before teenagers. Any, any great stories or anecdotes of the both of you? Not, not just him, but you too. Um, oh golly, I don't know, but whatever the anecdotes I, I remember that, that are in my book, oh, okay. but, uh, it, um, let me think. Well, we want to give people a, a little appetizer, a, a reason to go get your book, My Kid Brothers <laughs> Band, The Beatles, it's, by the way, from Acclaim Press, that's the place to, uh, you know, the publishing company, but, you know, a particular memory. Yeah, well, um... Well, let me think. Oh, gee. Well, I, I can tell you um, a memory from when George, back in 1963, mm -hmm. when he came to visit me in the United States. I had just moved here in the in the March, and uh, they were doing pretty well at that time. You know, Mum was sending me their singles, and George came to visit me in September of 1963, and. Uh, 
during the, the, his trip, we went camping quite a few times, and uh, he was rather alarmed at the different kind of insects that we had in the United States. Yeah. And but one evening while we were camping, um, he noticed this uh, beautiful green leaf, and he went over and, and the, the leaf started walking around the tree, and it's, you know they called it a leaf insect. And so he was filming it. And then later that evening, we were sitting around the campfire, you know, roasting um, hot dogs and uh, marshmallows. And a, a little twig fell on his arm. And he went to brush it off, and it ran up his arm. And it was a stick insect. And he sat there and he said, "I wish these, I wish these insects would own up." He said they, they were all in disguise. And so uh, that I remember that little incident. He was quite uh, flabbergasted at the uh, the insects pretending to be something else. And actually, one thing that you mention in the book that people might not realize about your brother is, uh, even though it was obvious that he loved comedy because he got involved with Monty Python and had made films and some of his videos were kind of cute, but he was really, he was a bit of a zingy, cut up kind of character and people don't see him as that. Exactly. Well, you see, he got that, um, the wrong name, uh, or misnamed but by the press when he came over to do the Ed Sullivan show because uh, he had a strep throat when he arrived. They had been in Paris uh, just before they came to the States and while he was there he got a strep throat and his, his temperature when he arrived in uh, New York was 104 degrees. And the, uh, the doctor at the hotel, the doctor Gordon at the hotel, came and examined him. And first of all, he said, we need to get this youngster into hospital because he's really, really ill. And Brian Epstein almost had a heart attack on the spot <laughs> because, you know, we'd all been working so hard to get them to the United States. And here Brian thought, you know, the whole thing's got to go down the drain because George was ill. But anyway, the doctor worked really hard at, uh, you know, everything he could think of to make sure that he got back on his feet again. And so, uh, you know, that was why when he was going to all of the press conferences, the doctor said to him, you know, save your voice, don't say anything. So for the most part, he was silent at all of the press conferences, and then the press dubbed him the quiet beetle. But he's no more quiet than anybody else, really. Oh. That's funny how that influenced the whole rest of the, the next seven, eight years of that band. Yeah. Oh. They used to have quite a bit of fun with that, too, because whenever he was in a situation where he was being asked stupid questions, he would just say, well, I don't know, I'm the quiet one. <laughs> now, how, how involved were you? I know you got the Beatles on a bunch of radio stations or their, their songs on them. Did you literally go with him to a couple of local radio stations and sit in and, and meet the hosts and do that kind of thing? No, no, no. That was that was like way, way, way in the distance. Oh. But um, when, when I was, you know, before he came over to the state, he was just here for two weeks in September. At that time, I had managed to get his... Um, one of his, their songs played on one little radio station about six miles from where I lived. And George did go with me to that radio station to thank the young lady. She was a, a teenager at the time and her father owned the radio station and uh, his name was Mr. Schaefer and uh, his daughter Marcia was uh, given the record and she played it on her teen program on a Saturday afternoon. And so, uh, when, when George was uh, in the United States in September of 63, he did uh, say to me, well, let me go and thank that young lady for playing our record. So he did do that. And um, unfortunately, although she was actually officially the first person to play a Beatle record in the United States, some other people nearer to the East Coast uh, managed to claim that distinction it was um, a, a DJ by the name of Carol James in Washington, WDDC, I think it was, and uh, he came to the Ed Sullivan Show being lauded as the DJ to be the first one to play the Beatle records in this country, but he just happened to be hooked up with some people that had more, um, I, I don't know, more connections than I did, and so he got all of the praise for being the first one, even though he wasn't actually the first one. Well, it's like the Thomas Edison story, where he had all these people working for him, and uh, a lot of them did the main work of the inventions, but of course he was the, the head guy, so he got the credit, you know, and it's who you know, as it were. 
But yeah, yeah. But either way, we're talking with Louise Harrison, the author of My Kid Brother's Band, A.K.A. The Beatles, and bringing the George first in 1963 for two weeks to just hang with you and to go to a couple of stations and things. And then, can I ask, what, what were your impressions of Brian Epstein? Did you met him? Yes. Yeah. He was a very, very nice uh, young fellow and very, very, uh, what's the word, dedicated, you know, to the, uh, the task that he'd sort of taken on accidentally, more or less. And so, uh, you know, he and I had a good, great deal of correspondence. I was writing 16-page letters to him every week because I was, uh, you know, doing as much research as possible. You see, Brian, he wrote his own book at one point called The Cellar Full of Noise, and he explained in the book that, uh, you know, he was the son of a very, very wealthy parent. His father owned a department store in Liverpool, and he explained in his book that, you know, he was quite a bit of a disappointment to his father because he didn't do terribly well in school. And so when he left school, his father decided, okay, well, we have to find something for him to do. So he put him in charge of the record department in the department store, figuring that you know, that was the department where he could do the least damage. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so that was where Brian was. But it just turned out very, very fortunate that he was in the record department because at round about that time, uh, all of the Beatles fans had heard that the Beatles had actually uh, played, uh, been recorded when they were in Hamburg. And they played with um, an artist by the name of Tony Sheridan. They backed up some of the songs that he put out. And so uh, the fans that were accustomed to seeing the Beatles at the Cavern Club in Liverpool were running around to the local stores. And it just happened that NEMS, the store that Brian's father owned, was right in that neighborhood. And so there was, you know, youngsters coming in by the minute saying, do you have any Beatle records? And so he see, caught on to the idea that, you know, this must be something pretty big because they've got so many people asking about it. So uh, he went off and ordered a whole bunch of them. So and they sold out within minutes. And so he decided, okay, let me find out something about these guys. And uh, so he went to the Cavern Club and met them. And, uh, you know, being a much more wealthy person than any of them, he said, well, maybe I can try to help you to, uh, you know, to get somewhere. And that was how the whole association started. Can I ask you, did you ever see the Beatles play or rehearse or do a gig or, I mean, even in the late 50s, before they went off to Hamburg and, and stuff, did you no, ever? No, no, no. I had already left. You see, I was 11 when he was born. Right. So, you know, I was quite considerably older than him. And so by the time he was starting to work, work with the Beatles, I had already left uh, Britain. I lived in Canada for a number of years, and then I lived in South America, and then uh, in 63 moved into the States. Uh, my husband was a very, very brilliant Scottish engineer, and so he was in great demand all over the place for his skills. <clears throat> So, you know, I didn't see George for a number of years until, and that was why he wanted to come to visit me in 63 when he finally had enough money to buy a round trip ticket and, you know, come to the States because he had, by then he had a niece and a nephew, that, you know, my two children. Of course. He wanted to meet them and to see me again, you know. Yeah. Have you had contact over the years with any of the other Beatles? Have you met them, talked to them, seen them, anything like that? Yes, quite a few times, but I, I always made a point of not pursuing them. You know, I figured there were so many thousands of people pursuing them that I have never, ever made any effort to, uh, you know, to sort of cozy up to them or anything like that. But whenever they are doing a concert, if I should happen to be, you know, able to go, like, for instance, last um, fall, uh, Paul was doing a concert in San Diego, and I had been invited to uh, to visit the area around about that time. And the gentleman who invited me and the, the guy who plays George in my band, and we both went to the concert. We met Paul, and uh, we, I was able to give him one of my books. And it was funny because I called the book My Kid Brother's Band because back in 63, when I was running around to all the radio stations with their singles, um, there was no use me saying in 63 saying the word Beatles because everybody would have thought, you know, maybe I was an exterminating company or something, you know. They had never, you know, the word Beatles was not in anybody's mind to have anything to do with music. Or even Silver but, Beatles, right, yeah. 
Exactly. So I was just saying my kid brother's band. So anyway, when I handed Paul a copy of my book and he looked at the front of it and he says, your kid brother's band? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, again, he was one of the other people that didn't know the story about all of my efforts trying to promote them back in 1963. So uh, that would probably be a shock to him too, to, to find out what I did. In your correspondence and your, your talking with George over the years, did you have an insight into his relationships and his squabbles and his, his things with Paul? Because it, it seemed like they were uh, you know, chalk and cheese for a bunch of years. But they, they always got along fine. Most of the, you know, again, it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because of the, uh, the amount of distortion in the press about them for, you know, ever since they started, really. Um, and so the reason behind the book, too, is to let people know that, you know, a lot of the nonsense that was, is talked about in the press, like feuds with this one and that one, that they didn't really happen. You know, there may have been a, one moment when they might have said a crossword to each other. You know, when you're working with four guys working so closely together for as many years as they did, I mean, obviously there would have been moments of dissension, but that didn't mean that they all hated each other or that they were all going to sue each other. You know, it was just... Uh, maybe even, a, even in 1969-70, even yeah. during the Let It Be period, even then and, yeah. and after that, there were, you know, they had moments of problematic things, but overall... They were still they were, they were good friends, yeah, yeah. And very supportive of each other, yeah. Now, can I ask, were you in touch with George Dur You know, And again, it can be just epistolary, it can be uh, writing to him, but uh, um, during the period of John Lennon's assassination in 1980. Yes, as a matter of fact, it was I who called George uh, to let him know. Uh, I called his house, and he, he only ever had one phone in that big house in Fire Park. And... Uh, it was just in, in a little cubby hole underneath the stairway. So although I called him, nobody answered the phone. So then I called my brother Harry, who lived at the gatehouse in our George's estate. And I called him, it was about six o'clock in the morning in, in Britain. And I called him and told him what had happened. And I said, you know, let George know, uh, you know, as soon as you get up, let him know what had happened. So, uh, you know, that, that was how he found out. And, well, did you speak to him at some point in that period? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, he called me, and uh, oh, he, was, he was really horrified. And actually, at that point in time, too, he said to me, you know, you'd better stay invisible, he said, because you've got these crazy people out there in the United States with their guns, and, uh, you know, anybody can get their 15 minutes of fame by uh, obliterating somebody who is famous, you know, and he said... Uh, your connection to me might make you a target, you know. So uh, for, for many, many years, I, I did keep very, very much undercover sort of thing. It wasn't until um, in the 90s when uh, I had grandchildren, I started being very, very concerned about the climate and about the environment and, you know, the total devastation that we humans were, you know, putting onto our planet that I, I started a non-profit organization and I called it drop in because I thought that dropping out is not what we should be doing. We should be dropping in and taking responsibility for the health of our planet. And so uh, at that point I started, you know, and got out into the public a lot more <clears throat> and started, you know, gathering people together to become what I call drops. And the word drop was, uh, the, you know, the anagram for the motto. My mo the motto was determined to restore our planet. Oh, nice. Was the, the word drop. Yes, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had a lot of people. I was the, the idea behind it was if we gathered enough drops together, you know, one drop may not uh, be very important by itself, but if we gather enough drops together, we could maybe form a tsunami which would be much stronger and be able to, uh, you know, create some momentum. Well, did but you back hear, then um, in the 90s, nobody really was interested in the planet anyway, and they're still not terribly interested, although they are starting to understand a lot more, you know, what kind of peril we're in, especially with droughts all over the place, you know. Well, did you hear the uh, the Pope came out? Exactly. 
exactly. And you know, it's funny because uh, I just spoke to somebody, a friend of mine last night, and I said, I wish I could get in touch with the Pope because he and I are on exactly the same page. He's saying all the same things that I had been saying during the 90s when I had my drop-in organization. And even uh, another of the things that I have said many, many times is that, and what, one of the things that my mother said to me back during World War II, and it was a remark that I made at a Michael Moore uh, anti-war rally, mm -hmm. was that it's not the soldiers and the ordinary people that start wars, it's the people who are building the bombs and making the bombers and making the munitions and the weapons. They're the ones that start creating war because they can make so much money out of it and they don't give a darn about how many lives are lost or how many people's bodies are mutilated in the process so long as they make their big ton of money out of selling the guns. Well, that's the military-industrial so, uh, complex. The come out and said pretty much the same thing. So I said, hey, you know, he and I are on the same page. I wish I could get together with him. <laughs> that's right. Well, you can, you can add him to the band. It can be John Paul, George Ringo, and... He seems to be a wonderful person, uh, you know, as far as uh, being able to get people of all faiths together. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really great. Well, you know, incidentally, uh, you can edit this out if you like, but uh, when I was a little kid, uh, my parents had a friend, um, uh, Mr. Isaac Orleans in Liverpool, and he was constantly begging them to let him uh, uh, adopt me. Uh, he and his wife had been married for quite a while and didn't have any children. And he was constantly, every week he was asking my mom, can't I adopt uh, your little girl? He said, I, I would love to adopt her. So I might have, uh, you know, if, if they'd have uh, been willing to let me go, I might have been uh, brought up in that faith. Huh, you never know. Hey, can I ask, speaking of little kids and neighbors and things like that, when you were in, I guess it was Iowa in the 60s and 70s, uh, I read somewhere that you were on the same street as John Malkovich. Do you have any uh, memories of him? Oh, I don't know. I, I've never heard about that. Oh, well, so, somebody uh, in that, that same neighborhood uh, that you John were in. Malkovich. Oh, he's the guy, he was a... Uh, or in Illinois. It must have been Peoria or something. No, no, it was it was Benton, Illinois. It Benton. was the, the town where we lived, the, the town that George visited. Yeah, he also came from that same town, yes. Oh, but you never met him. It wasn't during your same... No, I didn't. Ah. No, I didn't even meet me. I met his brother, who was um, a reporter for the paper. He interviewed me a couple of times. Oh, cool. Now, we are talking, as I mentioned, with Louise Harrison, the author of My Kid Brother's Band, a.k.a. The Beatles, from Acclaim Press. And a few more questions, of course about your brother and the Beatles and, and things like that. And, and not to dwell on the negative, but we were talking about John Lennon's assassination. Somebody tried to kill your brother. I mean, where were you when that happened and were you in touch then? Yeah, I was in touch, yeah. Um, in fact, um, I was living in Sarasota, Florida. I lived there for a number of years and I'm hoping to go back there later this year. But. Um, yeah, I, I was in touch, you know, with, with the family around about that time. But, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I've, I've lived in this country now for over 50 years. But, uh, yeah, that, that was, again, you know, the, it's, it's happening all the time on these crazy people. Well, not necessarily crazy people, but or evil people, whatever. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, even for it to even happen in Britain, of course, it, he wasn't using a gun, which... Is a, a change for most of these uh, horrible things that happen. They're mostly with guns, uh, like the thing that happened just two days ago in uh, Charlotte, South right. Carolina. So, but, but um, were you, I guess, you were a lot less in touch with your brother in later years? Was, was there a, difficulties with his second wife, Olivia, or... Or not? Uh, well, I, I, I would not want to uh, address that uh, topic, uh, but um, yeah, it, it was difficult for my, my other two brothers and myself to be able to reach him, uh, you know, towards the end. And, um, you know, it's, there's this sort of tricky question when you have, say, family members who become incredibly rich and famous, and you've had, you know, a couple of marriages in your own life, and, and on some level you were taken care of, but not in the way that we would necessarily think. Oh, well, she's the sister of George Harrison, therefore she has a stipend yeah. of... I mean, you got, what, like two grand uh, a year, a month, what was it, for a while? Uh, 
Yeah, when, when um, <clears throat> I think it was when I was about 65, uh, after I uh, became, had become single for the second time, unfortunately, both of the, the, the gentlemen that I had married were both uh, succumbed to alcoholism. Oh. And so my brother knew that I was going through a lot of, uh, you know, hardship with being beaten up and everything. And so he had said to me, you know, don't go getting married again. There's no reason why you should have to uh, to do that. He said, you know, he said, given his own circumstances, he said, there's absolutely no reason why you should ever be, uh, you know, have any problems with being able to afford to live. And so he, he asked me, what did I need to live on a, a month? And at that time, I was living in Sarasota, and uh, I asked my two neighbors, and they came up with a figure of two thousand dollars. <laughs> but they were talking about, you know, what it costed to, uh, you know, to have the lawn done and take care of the pool, those kind of things, you know. So anyway, um, I didn't realize that they both had their houses paid for and their cars paid for and everything. But anyway, I told them, told George, two thousand a month, which I managed on very, very well. And uh, that that was very very nice, you know. And, but unfortunately, when he died, uh, although it was supposed to be a life pension, uh, unfortunately, I'm still alive. But the pension <laughs> isn't. <laughs> no, but you're not in his will, which is is shocking, I think. Well, no. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, hey, I'm a real Harrison. I'm not. I didn't marry into the family. I'm a real Harrison. And so, you know, our whole attitude is. You know, you don't. If somebody tries to knock you down, you get back up again. And so, fortunately, I met these guys that now are Liverpool legends. And we said, okay, well, the thing I know most about is the Beatles. So we started our own band, and we've done very, very well. In fact, just a couple of months ago, we played to a sold-out audience of sixteen thousand people in Mexico City. So, uh, you know. I'm doing fine. I'm healthy. Thank I God. have a lot of good friends, and I would far rather have good friends than have a lot of money. Um, I guess you're right. I, I, I wish I knew. I wish I had both things, so I could decide, ah, I can do without the friends, I'll take the money, or vice versa. I'd, I'd like to have money for once, and then see how that is, and then I'll make that decision. But by the way, we should mention that the name of the band is Liverpool Legends. You can go to Liverpool Legends. Dot com oh. and and the band is also involved in a project for kids of some uh, what are they doing okay well what we do a few couple of years ago you know when we heard about all of the music departments in schools were being defunded and we said well I, I've always thought that whatever you know there's a problem in this world for every taste you know there's a problem to suit every taste and i've always said whatever problem you are most concerned about you should try to become part of the solution and so in our case we thought okay so the thing that we know most about is music so we decided to start a project where we get in touch with the um does trans mm -hmm. Any music directors listening, uh, they can get in touch with us through LiverpoolLegends.com, and we send the charts of our music that we play in our show to the music director, and then he spends a couple of months teaching his music students the, the music, and then we arrange to come to the school and perform with the, uh, you know, with the students in the auditorium. We try to make sure the auditorium has about you know 600 or more seats so that we can get a good sized audience. And then uh, I publicize, you know, I do uh, radio and uh, newspaper interviews in the area so that we can fill the auditorium up. And then we're able to give a nice chunk of money to the schools. So, uh, you know, that's called Help Keep Music Alive. And we have just incorporated as a nonprofit so that it, people will be able to donate money to us and be able to get their tax write-off. So. Uh, we're hoping to be able to do a lot better in the coming years with that particular project. Nice. Uh, are any chances of coming either to New York or Colorado, that area? We, we, can, we can come anywhere that somebody will get in touch with us and work with us, and uh, we, we will get there and we will do the concert. As long as we can make enough money to cover our costs and also to be able to give some money to the school. So, yeah, they just get in touch with um, uh, Marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at LiverpoolLegends.com, and uh, we're very, very happy to work with uh, you know any high school as long as they have a sufficiently large. Um, or oh, yeah, six hundred at least. Students. Yeah, at least six hundred auditorium, uh, so that we can make enough money to be able to afford to get there, and to also to be able to give some money to the school. 
Can I ask you, Louise Harrison, do you have a favorite Beatles song? Uh, well, to me, my, my favorite George song is Cheer Down. But hmm. to me, the most important song that, they, that was ever written was the one that John did called Imagine. And I think, you know, the words of that song are so significant. You know, imagine all the people living life in peace and imagine all the people sharing all the world. You know, if, if only there weren't so many greedy people wanting to have most of it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, yeah, again, it's, it's, I say he is a dreamer, unfortunately, or he was a dreamer. Um, yeah. Well, he's not the only one, but he certainly was a, a dreamer, as was your husband. Uh, uh, sorry, not your, your brother. Forgive me. As was he in, in trying to find a more spiritual life. In trying, did you did you understand any of that? Did you try to, um, with the whole uh, you know the Maharishi and the India thing and the the Buddhism? Could you did you feel any of that, or was that just too weird for you? No, no, no. The, as, as I explain in my book, most of those um, teachings we were familiar with throughout our lives. In fact. I would say that most of the things that my father taught to me were very much on the um, on the lines of the Buddhist philosophy of never ever harming any other creatures mm. on the planet. You know, and that was very much his attitude. That was what he taught me. <clears throat> that, you know, in order to be considered that you're good, you don't ever injure or harm any of the other creatures, not just the humans, but any of the creatures on the planet. And so uh, that was how we were brought up. And so when George was, you know, uh, thrust into all of those teachings, I guess it was something he kind of recognized. Maybe he didn't think about it too much when he was a little boy. But, uh, you know, when he became an adult, it was something that resonated with him because it had been, you know, an underlying concept within his growing up. Now, even though you were out of touch, unfortunately, for a latter period of his life. I think there's somewhere in the book it says that your last time seeing him was two weeks before he passed. He was yes. in Staten Island? Is that true? Yes, uh, Staten Island, yeah. Why, I mean, uh, I'm glad that you did get to see him at that point. Oh, yes. Was he yeah, still yeah. recognizable? So we were able to yeah. chat for a while, yeah. Was he still recognizably your brother? I mean, he was obviously very weak. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He was pretty weak, but um, he was still himself, you know. He, he still had that little twinkle in his eye. <laughs> now, I remember from that period, though, that there was some talk and, and grumbling about his doctor kind of uh, using uh, him in a Oh, way. I know. That was absolutely hor horrific. Um, in fact, I did write a chapter in my book but my publisher left it out because he said it was ending the book on a, on a kind of a sad note. Uh, I was so terribly, terribly upset on behalf of that doctor. He was such a really wonderful man, oh. and he, wor he worked so hard. And that terrible story that was invented about that he had forced George to sign, what happened was... Um, George had been talking with the doctor uh, a lot of the, like, the doctor would sit with him for hours during the day when, you know, when nobody else was there and uh, massage his feet and, you know, just talk to him, try to keep him comfortable. And during the conversations, he would talk about his children. And his son, who was a, a teenager at the time, and uh, he had just had been learning how to play the guitar. And so my brother had said to him, oh, you know, you have to bring him to see me. I can give him some encouragement about his guitar playing. So anyway, it just happened that um, the day that I saw George was also the day that um, they had arranged a, a private plane to take him to um, California. And so when I visited George, uh, like I say, he was, he was in good spirits. He was weak, but he was in good spirits, and he was still himself. And so shortly afterwards, uh, the doctor, Dr. Lederman, brought his son, Aaron, to visit George. And uh, George played, uh, <clears throat> he took the kid's guitar and played a, a little bit of it. And, uh, and then the kid played for him. And, you know, he was encouraging him. And so while George had the guitar in his hand, a little Aaron said to George, hey, would you sign it for me? And so George said, oh, I don't think I can even remember how to, how to spell my name. He was joking with him. Uh -huh. 
Anyway, he got a pen and he signed his name and oh, it was, did it very, very small and he also put the ohm symbol after it. Are you familiar with the ohm symbol? Yeah, it's like the 33 and a third thing that looks like yeah, the 33. Yeah, kind of like yeah. that, yeah, exactly. And so, um, he, you know, he signed his name with the ohm symbol after it. Anyway, um, what happened after that was that there was a great big, uh, about a week later, um, there was a big kerfuffle about saying that the doctor had forced George to take his hand and forced him to sign it. Well, the, the signature is so tiny that if anybody had had hold of their hand, it would have turned out an awful lot bigger, you know. Plus, the doctor and his wife, even though I was at their house uh, months later, they didn't even know what the ohm symbol was. <laughs> they thought his wife had said, oh, that little funny little mouse that jo George signed. They had no idea what it was, so had the doctor been trying to force him to sign it, he couldn't have forced him to sign the ohm symbol because he didn't even know what it was. Right. So I was so desperately upset. And, you know, the doctor was hounded and he's been called the evil doctor and all this kind of thing. And I've just been so upset about it. And I've been, it, in fact, in the chapter that I wasn't allowed to put in my book, I said, you know, I think it's really about time somebody apologized to that doctor because his whole career was sort of messed up. However, he did uh, go to another hospital in New York City, the Cabrini Hospital, and I actually went and met with the board of directors at that hospital and told them what I just told you now and said, you know, that doctor did never, never did anything to harm my brother. He was just a perfect, perfect friend to him. And I just felt terrible that he had gone through all of this hell in the press. And, you know, still all the people still talking about it. But he never did anything to harm my brother, and he never, never, never pushed my brother into signing it. And I have seen the guitar since. In fact, um, they were forced to give the guitar, which was the, it was their own guitar. Now, Dr. Liederman had bought the guitar for his son. I think it cost him $70. And they were forced to give it to the Harrison, so-called Harrison family now, in order so they had that signature. And so anyway, huh. later that year, I was invited to a big uh, thing in, in New York, and there were all kinds of people like Michael Moore and uh, Billy J. Kramer, a lot of people at that event. And so I said to the, uh, the doctor, hey, buy another guitar you know, a similar guitar, and bring it to the event. Now, he wouldn't come to the event himself, but he brought the guitar to the event, and I had all of the celebrities at that event. I told them the story, told them what had happened, and how the guitar had been, the kid's own guitar had been taken from him. And they, all of these other people signed the guitar for him, So, and I did too. So, you know, he doesn't have a guitar signed by George anymore, but he has a guitar signed by a lot of other people who were, um, you know, sympathetic to what had happened. I'm so glad I asked that question. I'm so glad you got to answer that for, for everybody, the world at large, not just the, the, the board at that hospital and those celebrities, but now, you know, get out there how maligned this poor physician was all those exactly. years ago. So, and, you know, the thing was, too, when he moved to this other hospital in New York City, 25 members of his staff moved with him because they knew that he was a good man. Wow. They wanted to keep on working with him. And so they all resigned from the hospital with him and, and went to this hospital in New York. So, well, you know, I certainly hope that enough people hear about this that, um, you know, the doctor's uh, reputation can be, as I say, I, I, I wrote a, a, a whole chapter in my book, but... Um, the, it's a shame the editor they, couldn't find room for it. If not at the end, maybe they could have revised and put, and put it somewhere you know, else in, in the book. Yeah. But, um, well, he was afraid that, um, that the person that I was talking about might sue him. <laughs> oh, you mean the journalist who... You, who no, not the journalist, but the person who accused my brother, who accused um, the doctor of holding my brother's hand and forcing him to sign the signature. Oh, I see. Ooh, okay. Now, let, let me ask you, um, speaking of guitars and, and worthy things, possessions like that, do you have a most precious possession 
of, of you know, <laughs> from your blood. Not, sure. not anymore. Everything that I ever had got either stolen or disappeared. Oh. I, I, I don't use, like to use the word stolen. I just say, I used to show people all of the memorabilia that I had. I would have things in boxes and I would show it to people who visited my house. And I have always I just said, well, you know, when I, <clears throat> pardon me, when I put the box away, there wouldn't be as many things in it as there were. <sighs> and I've, I've just used the expression that things stuck to people's fingers because I don't like to say that they were stolen. Well, and also, unfortunately, I mean, the, the big tragic thing was early songs that George had written in, uh, like, the very early 60s. You had a, a briefcase or a trunk of these things that was in a trailer... And what happened? Hello? I'm not, oh. I'm not familiar. No, I'm not familiar with that story. Didn't, didn't, didn't they get lost in a fire? In a, a trailer thing? Wasn't there a, a, some papers or, or songs that he was carrying around? That I you have had? no idea. I've never heard that story. Oh, dear. It was in one of the things that I was looking up, one of the articles that I was researching. Oh, I thought, I thought well, some... The, the, hey, but the thing is... Uh, All the articles out there are true, you know. <laughs> well, that's why I'm checking. That's why I'm asking some of these yeah. things. Yeah. You must, yeah. you, you must have some stuff left. I mean, I, I know you don't want to get you out there because you don't want people coming to rob you. But I hope that you do have a couple of keepsakes and things still. Uh, well, I still have the, a few of the letters that Brian Epstein wrote to me, and uh, you know, asking me to keep on helping to promote people, all that kind of thing. I still have a few of those. And uh, I'm also thinking now that I'm getting close to uh, my expiration date on this planet, that, uh, you know, if there are collectors that are interested, I might be interested in, uh, you know, in, in selling some of them to, you know, to a, a private collector. Because, again, you know, when I do leave the planet, I'd like to maybe, you know, leave a few dollars behind me for those, you know, people in my family that could maybe use a little helping hand. Well, or maybe there's a museum in London, or he was English, so it won't be the Smithsonian here, but there are Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I don't know if they have an archival thing. Yeah, well, I don't think those people could afford to pay, you know, what they're actually worth oh, wow. commercially, you know, because I've thought about uh, donating them to, uh, you know, to museums and, and the Hall of Fame and people like that. I have thought about that, but then again, you know, in this world where um, you do need to have money in order to pay your bills, it occurred to me also that uh, it would be fair to my uh, family, you know, there's only three of them, you know, left alive, but if, if there's anything that's worth, you know, has any value to it, I should put it, uh, you know, to the benefit of my family. I do have a, a trust fund, but it's only got about a thousand dollars in it at the moment. Well. But uh, you know, I'm hoping to be able to, uh, you know, have a few dollars left behind me when I go. Now, your family? You mean your sons? What do they do? Your children? Well, my son died with colon cancer sorry. about ten years ago. Uh, my daughter uh, has very bad rheumatoid arthritis on disability. And both my son and my daughter each had a son, oh. but I don't like to uh, I don't like to publicize you know, okay. again, you know. No, no, no that, that, that's. And what about your your two brothers? Are they still alive? Are they still on the estate? Uh, I'm not really um, uh, that familiar with what. I, I know my brother Peter died. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure about uh, about Harry. At the no, moment. wait a minute. Why are you, uh, with all due respect, why do you not even know about your own brother Harry and what he's up to? He's your brother. <laughs> well, there again, uh, he, he made a call to when my, my, my son was dying with uh, colon cancer. Uh, my son had tried to get in touch with the, um, with the family estate to see if he could get some help to get medical treatment. And my brother Harry called me and he said, uh, call your son off. Uh, you know, the family estate uh, doesn't want to know that there's anybody else with cancer in the family. Oh. Yikes. So, <laughs> okay, I figured little... maybe i talk to Harry anymore, you know. No, I, I, okay, I get that. Now let me ask, okay. are you... I would prefer if you would edit that out. <laughs> well, well, I'm so, no, I'm just, that's awful to... Uh... 
to hear. But but I'm happier now. Do you you have friends? Are you are you dating anybody? Or are you past that? Oh no! Ooh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you sound like a pretty spry eighty-four to me. You know. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I've got to have a, a somebody telling me what to do. <laughs> Love that. Love that. And I have loved talking. Oh, sorry. Yes. I mean, to me, the best thing in life is to be able to be single and to be able to determine your own whether you're going to go, you know, to, uh, I just went up to Rochester to, with my band to perform at the Mayo Clinic. They were having a big uh, event for all of the retirees, there were a thousand uh, people that had retired in the last year, and they brought my band up there to uh, have an event for them. So, you know, I'm just happy to be able to uh, determine my own comings and goings and not have somebody saying, oh, you've got to be there to cook my dinner, you know. That's fair. Okay. All right. And, and you know, thank God you're in good health and you've got the band. They're called Liverpool Legends. You can go to liverpoollegends.com. Remember that they're also involved in, and they've just been incorporated into a nonprofit for Help Keep music alive, alive which you know we will be helping schools if, if they, they can be brought into that and of course you are the author of my kid brother's band aka the beagles from acclaim press books and you can go to their uh, to louise's facebook page my kid brother's band to find out more about the book more about the stories and how to order of course and and get a copy for yourself last question for you louise and we thank you so much for, for being with us if your brother were still alive and you and you were in touch what's something that you would say to him now to him now uh, it's been quite a trip <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah that works quite a trip yeah well it has been delightful taking that trip that journey with our new friend of the neighborhood louise harrison i wish you much more music much more success, much more advocacy for the environment and for students and for children. Success with your book. Good health and good times for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I do appreciate uh, Rabbi Saul Solomon to, to having me on Dave's Gone By on UMC Radio. Thank you all very, very much. And I'd like to say to all of my Beatle people out there, hello and cheerio from your mum. <laughs> <laughs>